to thank you for joining us for another episode of Hope for Healthcare with Dr. Katie Cole in partnership with ICD Healthcare Network. Dr. Katie Cole is a holistic physician, organizational well-being consultant, and change agent, working with industry leaders and proven strategies to heal our national healthcare system and our culture of medicine. Stay tuned to hear today's speaker. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hope for Healthcare. I have a very special guest this week that I would like to introduce you to. His name is Dr. Michael Privatera. Um, Mike is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Rochester Medical Center and medical director, medical faculty, and clinician wellness program, which works on both individual and organizational interventions to reduce clinician burnout. He is also a national expert on human factor ergonomics and how this can help mitigate burnout and promote healthcare organizational well-being. Well, welcome, Mike. We are so happy to have you here today with us. Thank you, Katie. It's a pleasure to be here and to be with everybody else. <laughs> well, gosh, you know, with our conversations, we've talked about so many different subjects and, and Mike, you really wear so many different hats. Can you tell us just a little bit about yourself and what you're doing right now at your health system? Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm a consult liaison psychiatrist, which is a psychiatrist that goes to the uh, medical side of the hospital. So see people in medicine, surgery, OBGYN. And I've been also involved a lot in, in mood disorders, um, sort of treatment resistant mood disorders. But in, in this, in the just the course of practice, um, in getting into the issue of seeing so many people struggling. So um, I see clinicians of all different types working, um, has got, have gotten into workplace violence, seeing what that's done to our uh, healthcare population, had been doing some research in that for a while. And then now, since about the time of a lot of um, changes in healthcare, the early, you know, 2010, 20, 2009 or so, getting into clinician burnout and seeing just how many people to my right and left have been uh, really, have been really excellent clinicians, but just struggling to do the work and take care of people and kind of, uh, kind of like how that has not been seen to be addressed has been just really sad over the time. But uh, finally getting into the position of being our hospital level of uh, wellness director uh, since about 2015. So I've been here in that position, since, you know, for about seven years now. Well, wonderful. And, you know, one of the topics that you are really passionate about and an expert in is human factor ergonomics. Can you tell us a little bit more about this concept and how you have been able to apply this to the healthcare setting? Okay, sure. Um, it, it started back in, um, actually in some of the uh, the aspects of workplace violence and understanding a little bit organizational contributions to workplace violence. What is it that's kind of um, setting people off, losing their patience? Um, what is it about the organization and all the expectations that come from the system? So I started to look into it back then, which was in the early 2000s, um, and got to work with a colleague from Australia. His name is uh, Vaughn Bowie, and he actually had one of the uh, in typology of workplace place violence of uh, organizational contributions to workplace right. violence. Um, in addition to what OSHA has, they have four of them, but this was an addition to that. So then when looking into burnout more, just kind of seeing all the, the things, all the changes that were made kind of at the same time and realizing how are humans going to be able to do this as the, you know, you know physicians, nurses, they're still humans, they're in the human club. And there's so many expectations that that were uh, coming to their role from disjointed authorities, not collaborating, not harmonizing. And that made me think, um, well, we know we don't feel good when we're going through it. What is the science that can help explain what it is we feel? And what is the science that can help us to find a way out? So kind of looking into that, you know, what do other other um, Occupations do. What a pilot. What's what helps pilots? What helps astronauts? Mm. Helps um, you know uh, air traffic controllers, even um, people that have to to translate at the UN. They're given mandatory breaks. You know, it's because the brain fatigues in terms mm -hmm. of being accurate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why don't we do that? Why don't we do that in healthcare? We we seem to be 
applying human factors in different ways, but not but we're not enough upstream. We have it at the point where if something bad happens, how we evaluate it, you know, how we distinguish. So um, more reactive versus being proactive. Yeah. You're yeah, saying we in healthcare, we've reactively been using human factor ergonomics, but but now you've come up with a system to proactively use it to also exactly. measure the well-being of healthcare employees. That's exactly exactly right. And a lot of things that we look at about medical error, for example. Well, what can you do to prevent yourself from certain biases at the point that again is putting the onus again on the, the clinician as opposed to what will help prevent that from happening so called latent conditions for error, you know that the, the uh, IOM in 20 in no, 1999 talked about the error is human and all the medical errors but and they said by far. The most predominant cause is due to systems mm -hmm. systemic contributions. Um, so why don't we dig into that instead of so many expectations on the individual, you know, all the educational aspects, uh, certifications, maintenance of certifications, and a lot of that, you know, we learn it and then it comes out of our brain. Right. Uh, and so that's not really getting at the issue. How can we make the environment, the work environment, which is the same as the uh, healing envi environment for a patient? It's the same space. Why don't we look at it? That what can we do to improve the environment and the conditions so your brain is optimal when you are seeing the patient as opposed to working against the flow of the, the fire hose of expectations basically so yes. can yes. we help leaders can we help leaders see them see them happening before they occur um by understanding something about human factors um so it actually the kind of, the difference a bit from lean, for example, is lean, you, you've seen problems and you're trying to improve and remove waste. Well, extraneous cognitive load is the waste we're trying to remove. So it's what is, is happening that is causing more brain power to be expended that doesn't have to be there. What, how can we remove it? It's extraneous. It doesn't have to be there. Well, and one of the things I read in your material is that extraneous cognitive load can lead up to 87% of all medical errors. That was just astounding to me. Absolutely astounding. And right, it's and we, preventable. Right. In many ways, we can, we can right. reduce this. But if we have the, the understanding of this at the right place, mm -hmm. um, what, what are the influences that a leader has? A leader has an influence on resource allocation, culture, the um, the implementation of various um, mandatories, the implementation of various rollouts, new new things that have to come. So, if a leader uh, has some understanding of that, they can make decisions that are more commensurate with human limitations as well as humans' uh, optimal working. So, it's just like the right place where you know, some knowledge of this would be extremely helpful. So. So Mike, can you tell us a little bit about maybe one or two ways in which you were able to um, implement a rollout strategy for your own health system or how you were able to address your own ECL at Rochester? Right, okay. So one, one good example that everybody is struggling with is a number of mandatories that we have, for example, a lot of educational mandatories that are well-meaning right. um, and they come from various places that might come from OSHA, Department of Health, Joint Commission, et cetera. And again, a difference from like a pilot has only one regulator, which is the FAA. In healthcare, we have multiple regulators. Mm. So but they, there is no onus on them to have to communicate or harmonize or fit it into the workflow. That's up to yeah. us at the hospital level. That's where this comes in as a okay. hospital leader. Uh, so mandatories, if they're coming from many different um, regulators, can we use, uh, can we standardize how they come out? Can we keep track of the total amount of mandatory information? For example, what we did, first we surveyed all our mandatories. First, first attempt, we came up with 38 from, we figured out by working with medical staff office, mm -hmm. and patient safety office. And then we got into our learning and development group and came up with 84 and they're all coming or per year or yeah. quarterly. Okay. So, well, in, in some sequence, either quarterly, okay. yearly, uh, but some of them overlap depending on where you were. So it's somewhat less than 84, but it's somewhere between 38 and 84. But can we, can we roll them out in a way that 
gets to what the facts are. People expected without any time. So it's mandate without resource. Um, so you need either give time resource, cut down the job demand, or increase or add in RVUs or give credit for a physician or nurse taking the trainings. So they have time in their day to do that. Exactly. Um, okay, got it. That's exactly so, right. So that was one area that you were able. To, so so if it was the total was eighty four per year, do you know what you were able to take that down to, well, or what strategy well, this, to reduce that? In the first week after we uh, accumulated them all and brought them to our um, patient safety and uh, quality director, he took off 25% because wow, he realized great. it just by accumulating and putting them all in one place, yeah. to see the total mandatory load that already was therapeutic for our system because, okay. oh, you don't have to do this. We don't only have to do it too often. So it also started the whole process of review. Is this really necessary? And then we got, got into the concept that comes from economics called satisficing satisfactory and sufficient to meet the requirement, but you don't need your PhD in everything. I see. So that's great. Can you give us another example of how you were able to address ECL in your health system? Yeah, in terms of, of a lot of application by having input from clinicians that go to the building and optimization of the electronic medical record. That's another. Uh, that's been a big one. hot topic lately is <laughs> the it's EMR really and note bloating and everything that's happening and, and how that's slowing everyone down and contributing to a lot of burnout for physicians and nurses. Exactly. It exactly is. And some of it's driven by the expectations and compliance creep. In other words, the idea that not only are you meeting what the regulation is, but you're making it even more expansive than it needs to be. Um, and as some of it is our perfectionism, some of it's make people make decisions thinking it's it's a patient safety issue, but not realizing when you're overwhelming the brain of that clinician, you're actually setting them up to more mistakes. So it's that's why we I really firmly believe we need to integrate patient safety and clinician well-being. It should be highly communicative within the organization. So we okay. do this with human limitations in mind. I see. Well, yeah, and it, so it sounds like you were able to make an impact in your health system by addressing, and you know, one of the things Tate Shanafelt talks about in professional fulfillment is really tackling that, they call it low-hanging fruit. Right. Um, the areas on the front line that are really affecting productivity and leading to extraneous cognitive load. And if you can address some of those things initially, it creates more room to then be more creative and, and continue to work on streamlining the processes. Yeah. Absolutely. And you, and you think of the, the psychology of being part of the improvement too. So human, human factors, cognitive um, science is only one part of human factors. Human factors includes clinical psychology, organizational psychology, medical uh, science, safety science, um, okay. anthropomorphic. It's, it's got about uh, 10 or 12 different sub divisions, but it takes the best of, of all of them. And it, it's, it's, that's why it's so beautiful for helping the system to work better as well as the workers' well-being. So it's, it's the perfect marriage, really. And, you know, so for all the CEOs and, and chief financial officers and medical officers listening today, um, you know, the one question we always want to know is what is the financial impact in addressing some of these issues? And Mike, do you have any information around how that financially helped your organization? Well, we, we just, um, we would like to next step get into, for example, as burnout comes down, what does that do for recruitment and retention. Um, certainly, we, we know some of the other issues is patient satisfaction. Um, so once this gets a little more matured into the common practice of the organization and, and it's not uh, siloed, okay, you guys do wellness, you guys do that. Got uh, it, got it, it. Once we realize all this metric data, all these quality improvement projects, if we really work together and looked at the metrics in different areas, we can show at our institution how this is taking it off. But mm -hmm. already what we know is like, if people are looking for a new job and you wanna hire a physician, one of the big things is, what are you doing about wellness? What are you doing about our safety? 
those are the questions you ask when you're going to be when you're looking for a new job and right now it's we certainly need our where physicians our staff and we need to make it um, safe for them and a place that is sustainable practice we can do this for 40 years well, yeah, that you bring up a really good point. So are you already seeing the, you know, the younger generation physicians we've talked about, they're really, and, and healthcare providers are really wanting a more, um, I would say, holistic environment to practice in, one that allows for creativity, expansiveness, one that allows them to develop and their and maximize their potential. So if they're interested in research, maybe there's opportunities to do research in clinical medicine, um, but they're doing you know what they're passionate about at least 20% of the day. And that's what they're really asking for. And on my generation and your generation, you know, we didn't really have those opportunities. And so it, it makes sense that you know, your organization being able to say, hey, we've we've applied human factor ergonomics in several different areas, working on the EMR system, um, patient safety, the clinician well-being experience, as well as, you know, trying to bring joy back in the practice of medicine, more face time with patients. You know, that's what, that's why we went into healthcare. So it makes sense that if you're offering these things that you would be um, more competitive in the market for hiring. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. You know, we're starting to see that already. And um, people that have come from other places have, have, have told me that we're talking and working on this more than places they came from. And uh, right now, as, as we know, with staff shortages, it's, it's critical. So very so, critical and retaining the people we have the sense of in that human factors is also the issue of showing that we we value everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, the recent studies about what keeps people on the job, especially with COVID, what we've all gone through, if they feel valued, it makes a huge difference. That's the clinical psychology of human factors too. So it's that's why the whole field is is kind of wonderful. Yeah, that that's really fascinating. So feeling valued at work is one of the um, key drivers that can you know promote engagement in reverse burnout. Um, feeling valued at work, feeling appreciated for what you're doing. And it, it makes sense that human factors would embrace that um, for you. Right, exactly. And it's yeah. part of the, the big umbrella of human factors. So we've got, we're, we've talked a lot about extraneous cognitive load and that's the cognitive science, but we can use that in addition to kind of the yes and. Um, and so also kind of getting an idea of, especially when we talk about work, uh, is it a bit, I've been making the distinguishing factor of calling it virtuous work versus non-value added work and helping people realize especially when you have the culture of medicine that is you know we're we're super men super women and we're tough um but a lot of the stuff we're asked to do may not be value added work it's stuff that we have to get on the phone with it because the computer's not working it's extra writing the note bloat you mentioned Mm -hmm. uh, too much of that. It doesn't need to be there. Somebody else thought it might be. Mm -hmm. You still have to comply uh, to survive, but you can do it in a way that isn't so onerous. And that's where human factors comes in. You still can meet the requirement, but you don't have to overdo it. I see. So it sounds like it's a process that really allows you to identify the key areas that are causing the problems system-wide. Right. right. And then it gives you a format for streamlining some of those processes. Right. Just like lean can kind of help you weed out what is not productive and what is not working, but it it's dependent on input from clinicians and healthcare providers. So everybody is having a say in how this process is affecting their workflow. Exactly. That's exactly right. And so that say is really part of uh, human factor application and organization design, so-called socio technical systems perspective. That's where that came in, in terms of, it actually started in the forties when uh, coal miners, um, coal, uh, coal miner um, operators and owners had hired a bunch of engineers and said, this is how we're going to mine coal. And they started applying it. And then realizing when they compared that to mines that actually the coal miners were involved themselves in those designs with the engineers, they compared the two, the ones that the coal miners are involved, much more effective, uh, efficient, and actually financially in better spots. So that happened in England in the 
in the 1940s, and it, it gave birth to sociotechnical system design, and that was taking off uh, for for quite a while until the, the issue is you need input from those doing the work, right? So we have in healthcare we have patient experience, we don't have clinician experience going to the to the leadership. We or miss the metrics that other piece that we're measuring. Yes, right. That we're measuring with a metric that routinely right. gets up there unless we do a survey. And we try to get it in a way that uh, C-suite can understand the data and understand really what's happening. Okay. So our organization design is, um, I think it's really been an issue, triple aim versus quadruple aim. Quadruple aim finally gets at the experience of providing care, which has been ripe for applying human factors in, in the experience of providing that care. And getting that information as a metric back up to the the C-suite, so they know what's going on. The, the, uh, they call them environmental sensors. What's going on at the point of patient care? Patients know what's going on. Clinicians know what's going on, but only the patient experience gets to the top. And, and the clinician part, that's what we need to develop. So are you developing that now for your health system, the clinician experience metrics? Well, I, some, well, some of the thing is, the nice thing is the major companies that we believe in, like, like Press Gaming, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're developing that fourth aim um, quite a bit okay. now. So especially if a hospital system already is working with Press Gaming or other, depending on, but the idea that Press Gaming is working on it, I think is extremely uh, great. And we're getting that socio-technical system design, which makes the organization operate better. Because you're getting okay. immediate feedback systems, like an academic medical center, and especially if the leader is more kind of autocratic, doesn't want to have the feedback, doesn't want other people involved in that. And unfortunately, our healthcare has been helping the auto autocracy to continue that way because there have not been in the, the aim structure, the framework, enough input as part of the framework of how we do business. So anyway that's that's the thought yeah well that's fascinating mike and i know that you've really been committed to this you said since about 2009 you've really been passionate about you know organizational well-being and um it sounds like you're really making an impact at your own health system um are there are do you have a process in place that you can share with others like if i'm a you know chief medical officer or, or ceo of a health system and i'm listening to this podcast um, how would I even begin to get started with looking at HFE and how to apply that for my healthcare system? Okay, I, I like, one, a lot of times what I do is refer to uh, an advisor suggests that I pull together uh, a website so I can kind of upload a lot of the papers I've written and, and some of the application issues. So I, I can share what the website is. It's uh, R for the Terra MD .com. Um, and there people can download for free any anything they want um, can contact me um, one paper that we put in there together was something that I wrote with uh, Kate McNamee Kate okay. is um, she, she's an extremely bright human factors engineer um, in medical device design and she worked she was willing to work with me on developing further the, how you integrate patient safety and clinician well-being by means of human factors. And it's really kind of, uh, remember in patient safety, learning about the Swiss cheese model mm -hmm. uh, of reason. Um, a lot of what we have in healthcare now, those layers of Swiss cheese are to protect within the system from error. And if people get, if too many of those holes line up, uh, an error happens. So unfortunately, we've gone a little bit overboard with layers of Swiss cheese. So they're not strategic. So we kind of have Swiss cheese on steroids. God. <laughs> like with <laughs> educational aspects and certifications, maintenance of certifications. Like we were talking about before, only about 13% of medical errors is attributable to knowledge deficits. But 87% is either direct or indirect cognitive load, extraneous, either, you know, cognitive load total. Got um, it, got it. Yeah, well, comes yeah. so for our audience, I will make sure that I have Mike's website 
posted on his webpage on our website, as well as, you know, we'll be posting in LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and other social media. So we will, you will have access to all of that information if you have any questions. And Mike, I can certainly make sure we have the paper available to the white paper that you wrote um, as well under your information. Okay. Yeah. Sounds great. Yeah. And then I'd be happy to help anybody. You know, we're, I'm working a lot now on how to teach others the application mm -hmm. in their institution. So, so once that you learn it, you recognize it's kind of like the invisibility of human factors. Um, right now, you may not see it because your eye isn't trained, or we don't, you haven't heard the terms extraneous cognitive load, and it's not in our vernacular, but it, it really should be is the point. Absolutely. That's a great point, Mike. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to wrap up today. I know we have so much to talk about, and I think Mike and I agree that we probably need to do another podcast um, in the future about some other topics that he's really working on and passionate about. Um, but if any of you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Mike. We, I will, ha again, have all this information available. And Mike, I'm so grateful for you being on our podcast today and sharing with us about this concept of human factor ergonomics and leadership training and how to integrate these concepts throughout the health system. Well, it's an honor to be here. So thank you for having me. All right, thank you. Well, everyone, we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your week and we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.